Welcome back to the game day experience powered by U.S. Club Lacrosse. It's your boy, Lax Guy Scotty, here at the Pinnacle Lacrosse Championships here at the Paradise Sports Complex in Naples, Florida. We've got another full episode for you, full of highlights and full of interviews from great people. Now, our first interview comes from New Jersey legend, Brian Breck. I only say that he's a Long Island guy, but he's coaching at Rutgers, so let me live here. Now, Brian Breck is the head coach of Rutgers University, and you guys know I love Rutgers University, so I had the opportunity to sit down with him and talk to him about the Scarlet Knights. Let's check out the interview. All right, guys, I'm here with the one and only Brian Breck, head coach of Rutgers University. Coach, how are we doing today? Very good, thanks. I'm happy to have you on today, um, especially because Rutgers – has a place in my heart, all right? But before we get going with some lacrosse stuff, I want to know more about Brian Breck. So you went to college to be a teacher, correct? Yes, uh, phys ed major, uh, you know, didn't really know if I wanted to teach and coach in high school or in college and had the opportunity to do both uh, early in my career and uh, loved the college game. Before you were at Rutgers, you were at Siena University, and you definitely left that place better than you found it. How did you go about doing that? You know, I was fortunate to be the first full-time head coach. It was a part-time position up until I got there, so uh, there was a, a, a lot of growth, uh, and I'm certainly uh, very thankful for the opportunities, the people I met, and the time I was there. Now, was Dennis Noonan the best player you ever found in Siena history? I'll tell you what, I, I'm, I didn't recruit Dennis, but I was very happy that Dennis and his teammates were in that locker room when I got up there. Yeah, I mean, I bet Dennis is a hell of a guy, but great athlete, competitor, and uh, he certainly was someone that we leaned on. You know, my first couple of years there. From Siena, you go over to Rutgers. What was it like getting the head coaching job at Rutgers? You know, I, I was excited. I, I grew up, uh, you know, as you said, going to uh, Sachem High School, and uh, my high school coach would bring us over to the Rutgers lacrosse camp. Back in the day, you didn't have all these showcases and and uh, club events. Uh, you know, it was uh, it was a Sunday, the Friday, you know, overnight camp. You stay in the dorms. You do skills and drills in the morning, and then uh, you know, play games in the in the evening. Uh, and uh, I, I know that's how I kind of you know got to know Rutgers coming over as a camper. Uh, and then uh, obviously as a college player coming back and being a counselor. So uh, it was always something that, uh, you know, being close to home, uh, being a major university, the facilities, uh, the location, um, you know, as a coach, uh, it was uh, had a lot of things uh, that you're looking for to you know, build a program with. I'm sure you got a lot of memories, but previously talked about how the game has evolved. And you've been in the coaching game for a while. So tell me how you think the game has evolved. There's there's more players uh, you know playing than there's ever been. So uh, the growth of the game ha has exploded. Uh, you know, just seeing you know you, you hear sometimes the um, you know the traditional and non-traditional areas of the country. Uh, you know, I think that is getting a little more broader. You know, I don't think there's as many you know there's, there's good players and good athletes everywhere. So I don't think you can pinpoint you know one, two, three locations that are the hotbeds anymore. I think that's a, a testament of uh, you know. Know, all the college players that have gone on to now continue coaching at the high school, the club, uh, the youth level, and uh, growing the game. So uh, it's exciting to come to events, uh, you know, throughout the year and see so many players from so many different areas, you know, coming together to compete. Awesome. And last thing before you get out of here, what can we expect from the Scarlet Knights this, this spring? I think uh, a lot of fresh new faces. So uh, we're we're a very young team. We're a very uh, new team with maybe the you know the names and the faces that you've seen over the last couple of years going to the Final Four and and uh, competing on uh, on our TV. Uh, those guys have graduated, and we have a, a new group. So it's a little bit of a turning the page, and uh, uh, got some fresh faces, got some young guys that are going to be. Um, you know, maybe the new names of Rutgers uh, lacrosse uh, you know, for the next three, four years. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Can't wait to give you guys my support, all right? Thanks, Coach. Oh, appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. The 26th single-A bracket had so much talent, and I was excited to see who pulled it out. And the winners of this bracket was Maine Select. Let's get into some of their highlights.
I got the pleasure to catch up with Hampton University's finest. I'm talking about Vincent Culpepper. He's a coach for them, and he's coaching under the legend Chad Woodson. I'd known him for a while, and I knew I had to catch up with him. So check out this interview with Coach Vincent Culpepper. All right, guys, I'm here with Vincent Culpepper, coach at Hampton University. Vince, how are we doing today? Hey, man, blessed. I'm excited to be out here and be in some good weather. That's that's awesome. I'm happy to be here too. Beautiful day. Uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out if I want the hoodie on or not. But we figure <laughs> goes it out. in phases. One of the one of the players on our team that had actually played before was our goalie, and with like two minutes left in the warm up, he takes a shot to the thumb, dislocates his thumb. So we put a, <laughs> we put one of our twelve guys that's left yeah. right in the goal who ne he's never played lacrosse before. And he's just one of those guys that would do anything for the team. So he jumps in the cage and he's like, what do I do? I'm like, just try to get hit by the ball. <laughs> like, so I started playing in, when I was in sixth grade. So that was like the early 2000s, right? So that was before there were no club teams. Uh, the, the middle school I was at happened to get a team because the high school wanted to start one. So they wanted to start a feeder program. So by the time I got to, to high school, uh, which I ended up going to a completely different high school, I was one of two guys had ever played before mm -hmm. right so that's what it was midwest lacrosse man football players and dads who coach football recruiting at an hbcu first recruiting at a d3 school how different are they from each other <laughs> i think i i mean hbcu division one division three they're all different yeah yep. they're all different uh hbcu right like it's just that it's a different vibe it's a different culture um you know we should probably have you come to come uh, to homecoming next week uh -oh. next year uh -oh. now that now i'm talking about it you need some first-hand experience i might i might um but it's division three i mean the biggest thing to me is division three you have to you have to recruit so many kids right like because i think the stat is like for every 10 guys that you recruit one guy's probably gonna commit so if you're bringing in a class of 10, that's that's a ton of guys, right? Yeah. Um, but the the other side, like the Division One side of things, so now we can be a little more selective because you do have to have a certain skill level to play at the Division One level. HBCU, now our pool drops. It's not that we shy away from recruiting uh, non-players of color because we recruit all, all players. Um, but the majority of the guys that are really interested in us are players of color. And there's only so many that can play at the at the Division One level at, in the CAA, right? Because we got to go line up against Hofstra and, and Stony Brook and those guys up there, um, and you need the talent to do that. <laughs> I'm not the most stylish guy out there, but I might have to pick up my game. I might have to. Yeah, we got a couple guys that can help you out. Really? Man. We got a couple guys on the team that will get you right real quick. You guys hear this? Yo, if you're trying to help your boy out, make him look uh, fashionable, help a brother out. Over the next couple years, as we get these next few recruiting classes and we're kind of flipping what this roster looks like, uh, I think that's what you're going to see. And it's going to be fun. And we're going to shock the world. We're going to shock the world. I love that. Let's go. You heard it here first. Vincent Culpepper, Hampton University. Thanks a lot, my man. My man. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. All right, guys. I'm here with Brady Garrett. Just scored seven out of his team's eight goals. Brady, what are you seeing out there, bro? You're doing magic. Uh, just think about being my guy off first step, you know. If there's a guy open, feed it to him. If not, I'm just going to finish the ball and put it in the back of the cage. I love it, dude. So if you had to compare your play style to any professional lacrosse player, who would it be? CJ Kirst. I, I like him. I like playing like him. Okay, okay. Did I say professional or college? It doesn't matter. CJ Kirst is about to be a, a pro anyway. All right, all right. So I like that. Now. How, how did you get so good at lacrosse, or how did you, uh, what do you attribute your skill to? Uh, just practice, always harp on that. Uh, big in the weight room, so six days a week I'm practicing, I'm going to the gym, working hard and giving them my all. Okay, so if we put me and you on a bench. Who's benching more, me or you? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, what? I, I think I'm benching a little more than you. How much are you putting up? You putting up like? 75. All right, all right. We might have to cut it right there. All right, 275. How old are you again? 17. 17. Damn, that's a whole lot of weight here. But, yo, 
make sure you guys keep an eye on my boy Brady here because that boy is putting up numbers. Now, the lacrosse world is a small world. Everybody knows everybody. And in high school, I got the pleasure to get to know somebody who went to a high school that was only a mile and a half away, and that was Scott Bita, a legend at Bridgewater Raritan High School, a legend at Rutgers University, and now he's a coach at Michigan University. And I got the pleasure to have an interview with him at the PLCs. Check it out. All right, guys, I'm here with Scott Bita. You, from the University of Michigan. Scott, how are we doing today? Doing great, man. Thanks for having me. I'm happy you're here, man. The thing about Scott Bita is that me and Scott go way back. We went to school that uh, schools that were less than a mile and a half apart. Yes, sir. And I think people don't recognize how good Immaculata and Bridgewater were. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Right? Some good battles back in the day. You got you to gotta put them on game. Tell them how good we were back in the day. <laughs> I'll tell you what, man. We had some really good battles, Immaculata versus Bridgewater. Great coaching. Uh, some great, like, legendary players. Uh, pretty much, like, overtime almost every single time I pl we played you guys, honestly. Yep. Uh, some just good classic jersey lacrosse, man. Something that always stuck out to me was your leadership. I feel like a lot of the teams, or especially Bridgewater and Rutgers that you were on, they were your teams, as in you were the one that everybody looked to for guidance. And do you feel like you're, like, naturally a leader? <laughs> That's a great question. I appreciate you saying that. I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think authentically, if you're, you're yourself all the time and you're a really good person, mm -hmm. um, I think naturally that, that is the natural part of it, right, and the leadership comes with it. Um, but I, I've always loved leadership. Uh, I just love it. I think that starts with my dad. I think my dad is an incredible leader, um, the best leader I know. And so he's instilled a lot of those values into me. But um, I've just been obsessed with leadership. I love the fact that somebody can come in and change the temperature of a room and change a program and um, really get guys to buy in and to own uh, what they're doing from an individual standpoint. I just absolutely love that part of it. So um, after you were at Lafayette, you're at Michigan now, where you're currently at. Yep. How'd, that, how'd that come about? Yeah, again, Coach Rogowski, uh, you know, uh, very grateful, believes in me a lot. Gave me my first job at Lafayette, and he was the um, defensive coordinator in Michigan, and an opening um, came up, and he called me right away and was like, I think this is an awesome opportunity. And I wasn't necessarily looking to, to leave Lafayette. I, I met my wife there. I, I loved Easton. I loved the program and whatnot, but just the opportunity. I'm a big opportunity guy. Um, the opportunity at Michigan was just incredible. And now it's funny that you're a Rutgers guy coaching yeah. at Michigan. <laughs> my, my, my friends bust my chops about that a lot. <laughs> trust me. So let's say Rutgers was playing against Michigan. Who are you rooting for in a football game? Football? Yeah, football. I'm still a diehard Scarlet Knights all right, fan. All right, all right. I was about to say, I was about to cut the listen, interview short. Listen, I, I, lo I, love, I love being able to go to Michigan football games, but I will tell you what, uh, Rutgers basketball oh, is yeah. really where my heart is. Oh. I've been going to games since I've been a young kid with my dad at the Rack, the best stadium in the country. Um, I am a huge <laughs> Rutgers Hoops fan. What does Michigan have to look forward to this year? Yeah, uh, very, very excited. I feel like um, it's been a great fall, man. You know, we've, we've had some incredible leaders since I've been there in two years over the time. Like I mentioned, Bryce Clay, and then last year, and leaders like Mikey Bame and Isaac Aronson and Ryan Schreiber um, and Justin Wheatfell. And so just incredible leaders that have been leading for four years. And so now you take them out of your program and they move on. Um, it's now asking other guys to step up and lead. And so it's been awesome to see some new faces in front of the room leading from the front. Um, and, and they've had some challenges in that. I feel like um, that's, that's the beauty of the fall is going through that. And then new faces on the field as well. I feel like we have a very, very talented roster. Um, but definitely, you know, some, some young guys and inexperienced guys on the field. And so kind of working out the kinks on that. Um, but really, really excited about where we're at as a team and as a unit. Just a big believer in, you know, the more connected and cohesive the group is, the, the better they would be, yeah. not necessarily the talent. And so I feel like in the last week of the fall, we really got together as, a, as an offensive unit, as a team. And, and so I'm very excited to see what, what's in store for 2025. Don't let Michigan get hot, man. 
All right, guys, I'm here with Michael Sluice, our goalie for Stealth Black Ops. Michael, how are we doing today? Doing great. Dude, uh, I heard you just killed it in the goal. Uh, what were you seeing out there? Was the ball moving in slow motion for you? Uh, you know, the shots, uh, they, they get slower as the game goes on. We just get in that zone. Felt really good out there. <laughs> that meant. <laughs> I love it, dude. Now, I've seen you play before, bro, and you suck out to me immediately. Now, how have you been maintaining that skill? Uh, just getting a lot of shots whenever I can, going out with the boys, passing around. It's all about having fun, you know. Now, if I was to shoot on you, right, you know, your boys got a cannon. If I was to shoot on you, out of 10, how many, uh, how many shots would you save? I think I got seven. <laughs> all right. Got seven. All right, guys. Uh, so kids still lie if you guys were worried about it, all right? Now, Michael, uh, if you had to control, if you had to compare the way you play goalie to any professional lacrosse player, who would it be? Uh, Matt DeLuca, Ward. Okay. Those guys really want to try and emulate. All right, two water dog goalies. I love it. I love it. Now, how has it been at the PLCs? How much do you enjoy being at this tournament? It's been a ton of fun with Stealth, you know. It's a lot of great energy out here and in Naples, too. Great weather, a lot of fun, great fields, everything. All right, yo, so you tell me, um, what do we see coming up? Like, do we have a championship game coming up next, or what's going on? What's going on for the rest of the day? We got a very competitive game. Uh, we got the semifinals coming up. I mean, it's true national black, I believe, and that's going to be a great game. And then after that, we'll have a championship if we win. And I was looking forward to the next game. Got to win that one first. You know, we'll see. Hey, one game at a time. You heard it here first from Michael Suzar. Best of luck, brother. That's it. Now, the 27A bracket was a tough one, but one team ended up taking it away, and that was Cap City. Let's check out some highlights. I got the chance to catch up with Trey Whitty, who is the director of Advanced Lacrosse. He's also a national champion at the University of Virginia in 2003. Not too long ago, don't worry about it. But make sure you guys put some respect on his name. And I got the chance to catch up with him, so check out this interview. All right, guys, I'm here with Trey Whitty, director of Advanced Lacrosse. Trey, how are we doing today, my man? Doing great. Been a beautiful day to be out down here in Florida, man. Palm trees and sun, so we're good. Now, I, I'm talking to a national champion here, all right? I, I, I know. I had to say it. I had to say it. It's from 2003, but was that one of the happiest moments of your life? It had to be, right? Yeah, a, a long time ago national champion, but, yeah, uh, great moment over 20 years ago now uh, to do that with some of my best friends. It's, it's something that, that we're very proud of, but that was a, a past life, right? My, my new life is on the sidelines, so. Not to make you feel old or anything, but 21 years ago, that's crazy. I was alive, though. I was alive. So that's what matters. All right. So, Trey, you used to coach at Powerhouse in Maryland, St. Paul's. What was that experience like? Oh, it was great. You know, I've, I've been teaching and coaching my whole professional career. Spent some time at McDonough and then St. Paul's. Um, Love the MIA, the competition of it. Uh, certainly, you know, I still believe probably the best conference in the country. Um, it's wonderful, but then, uh, you know, job took me down to Texas, where I've been in Dallas now for two-plus years. Uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun being down there and being in a school like St. Mark's and then and then working with Advance has been wonderful. Now, I love that you're a teacher because you're also talking to a fellow teacher right over here. You know, lacrosse on the weekends, teaching during the week. Yeah. Um, what skills do you see that are parallel between teaching and coaching? Well, I mean, there's the obvious of, of just, you know, giving information and, and having it, you know, kids to, uh, you know, execute that. But I think being a teacher allows, it makes you a better coach, right? You're around kids all day. 
Um, it's not all about lacrosse all the time. You understand that these guys have a lot going on, whether it's academics or social life or clubs or, you know, there's a lot in their lives. So I think having the teaching perspective um, allows me to kind of better connect with them on the field and understand, you know, what they're going through. And it's not, it's not all lacrosse all the time that there's, there's a lot going on that, that, they're, that they're worried about. So um, I think it's a blessing. It's an advantage for any coach that, that is in a classroom or at a school with kids all day long. We always talk about, as a sport, growing the game. And when we speak about Texas lacrosse, do you see the game really exploding down there? It is, and, and there's a lot of guys moving down there to coach and do different things, and um, there, there's interest. You know, the, the community is hungry, and it's been around for a while. It's, it's certainly not in its infancy, but it still very much feels like you know, we're just we're just at the tip of the iceberg, right? That that, that it's going to uh, continue to grow and be a great thing. And again, there's just it seems like every every month you're hearing about this this lacrosse guy's moved down to Dallas and is doing stuff. So, the more the more we get of that, that that you're going to see it continue to grow. I mean, the athletes are there, the desires there, um, and now you know they're getting a lot a lot more you know just just lacrosse people in the region. So. Um, yeah, it's been great. So you spoke about that family uh, mentality that the team has. What's that culture like at Advance? Well, you know, a lot of it's, you know, off the field, right, doing stuff at these events, team dinners, uh, you know, the kids all, they've got their ways of communicating. It's, it's creating positivity on the bench, you know, and for something like NDP South where we play, you know, with our regional teams then come together for events like this, you know, you've got kids coming in from different areas, which, you know, that can always, you never know how that's going to go, but creating positive vibes on the sideline, right? Preaching the, the team over, over personal glory is important. Um, there's just a lot of those kind of consistent messages that we try and preach is, is that it's about the group. It's about being a great teammate. It's about, uh, you know, in, enjoying the game and, and the camaraderie. And that's, we all know, us lacrosse guys, we all know that how special this game is and how special the community is. So it's instilling some of those things in our kids early. It's not always just about winning championships, putting goals in the net. There's a lot more to it. The 26 AA bracket put teams to the test, but one team emerged as the winner, and that was True National Black. Now let's check out some highlights. And that's a wrap here at PLC's at Paradise Sports Complex. The Pinnacle Lacrosse Championship was a good one. A great display of a high level of lacrosse talent, high level of college coaches, high level of vibes. And that's all you can ask for here. It's your boy, Lax Guy Scotty, signing off of Game Day Experience, powered by U.S. Club Lacrosse. We'll catch you next time. Peace out.